I'm Eric Chemi, and this is Politely Pushy. My guest today is Katie Banks. She's the VP Global People and Workplace at Nitro, a company founded in Australia, but that's now based out of San Francisco. But Katie, you're joining me from Ireland. So this is globally, you're all over the place. So of course, your title is Global People, right? Especially to run that organization right now in the world of technology, there's a lot of volatility going on right now. You must have a very stressful job managing employees all across the world, wondering, Hey, are we next? What does the future look like? We're watching the stock price. So thanks for coming into the gauntlet with me today. <laughs> no worries. Thanks for having me. <laughs> what is the hardest part of your job? What keeps you up at night? So I think for me, so I've been at Nitro um, quite a while. Um, and so I've I've evolved here as our culture has evolved. Um, and we've always stayed true to our culture, I suppose. Um, I joined when we had, I think it was 30 or 40 people in Dublin. Now we have 120. Um, we didn't have a UK office. We did, weren't in um, expanded out of Europe. Um, we're now across Europe. Um, so there's been a lot of change, um, but it's always been very exciting. And it introduces you to new cultures, um, people's way of life. You know, what works in some countries might not work in, a, in another. Um, and I think for me, it's about managing expectations so i always want the nitronauts as we call our employees to feel like they really belong um to feel like they fit um to feel like they're adding you know to our culture um so it's not necessarily about culture fit it's culture add so everyone brings something different something new that we can all learn from um but in terms of managing the expectations then and, and how do we make sure that everyone feels that sense of belonging and feels like, you know, what an employee might be experiencing, what a Nitronaut might be experiencing in our Toronto office um, is what our, you know, Nitronauts in Hungary um, are experiencing. Um, and that means trying to manage um, expectations on our perks, our benefits, you know, our programs, what we can offer and what we can't offer. Because what I found as we've expanded is that in some countries there's legal um loopholes to run through in terms of you know offering some of our certain benefits that we want to offer you know they have to maybe be contractually included um so there's a lot of change and i think you know as we grow and expand what's always on my mind and what i'm always thinking about i suppose is how as we navigate that do we ensure that one our, our culture continues to grow and continues to evolve um, but two, that everyone feels like they're treated the same, they're treated fairly, um, they have the same access to the great programs and benefits that we offer, um, and that there's no difference if you're in, you know, our Belgium um, team working remotely or working in our US team. Um, so it, it's taken a while, I think, to actually get to that point as we've navigated, you know, quite exponential growth. And we were very lucky that we grew um quite significantly by 35 percent um in 2020 when a lot of companies were were freezing just because of the pandemic they were freezing their hiring they were slowing things down a little bit a lot of companies unfortunately closed um and we were very lucky just given the nature of our business and digital transformation and digital documents that we actually kept going um but during that time it was still about managing expectations so i would love to give the nitronauts everything that they want and everything that will make them happy but that doesn't always happen it isn't always possible so it's how do we get the best and how do we make sure that everyone feels like they're receiving the same experience and that's what we lean back to when we talk about people and hr it's employee experience so how are they feeling the same experience no matter where they're located in the world and Briefly, just talk about your background. I know you've been at Nitro for a long time. You've worked up the, the ladder there in that department. Did you always dream of, hey, I'm going to be you know, in a human resources type of world? Did you fall into that accidentally in your career? How does somebody get there? Because I come from an engineering side. I come from the, the quant that I, you keep me away from the people, right? Because I'm not very good at that. I would never be qualified for what you do. So how did you fall into that? So it's actually, it's very, um, it's very interesting. And only probably about two years ago, um, I was talking to my to my mom. There was a, an advert on the TV, um, and it was for um, children's nappies, as we call them, or, or diapers in in the US. 
Um, and it was about like how kids are able to move around in them. And, you know, every child is different. So, you know, some child, some children will sit there playing um, with an abacus, but they did it really cleverly in that, you know, the child that was playing with the abacus, they were like, oh, and it, it shows how the child grows. And that child became, I think, it was an engineer or a mathematician. They had a child who was climbing all the time. Um, and obviously, like they're advertising their their product, but the child was climbing. And then, you know, they showed the child being a mountaineer. And I said to my mom, I said, it really resonates because she used to tell me when I was younger that I always had to have somebody to play with. I always needed to be around people. I could never be on my own. My brother, he's um, he's a scientist in, in Harvard Medical School. He would play in his own for hours, absolutely hours. I, as soon as I, you know, came home from school, I was like, can I go out and play with my friends? Why can't I have my friends over, you know, from a very early age? So she was, she said to me, she said, it's not surprising that you've ended up where you've ended up because it, it kind of naturally just is, is in my personality. Um, so yes, I've worked up the ladder in, in Nitro. Um, and I started off mainly kind of from an operational perspective. So I worked in operations for a long period of time you know, dealt with external customers. Um, it was in the travel industry. Then I moved to architecture um, and I worked as an executive assistant for a couple of years. Um, so again, kind of small company dealing with the, the employees, um, but also learning the ropes of, of you know, administration, um, you know, reporting, things like that. Again, dealing with external customers. Um, then I moved to the banking industry, so finance, um, and I worked as an operations manager um, and then kind of fell into, I suppose, they, they leveraged my executive assistant work. Um, and I was there doing operations and facilities and an opportunity came up um, to become lean certified. Um, and it was all around, I suppose, um, you know, kind of how do we encourage employee empowerment and employee engagement? Um, and they started an employee engagement um, committee with the CEO. Um, and I put my hand up to represent the operations department because it was something I was very interested in. And as I got more involved in that, it really triggered something in me where I was like, I this is this is what I want to do. Um, and so I was chatting with a friend of mine who worked at Nitro at the time as a marketing manager. And she mentioned that there was a, a role opening for an employee experience manager in Dublin. So we were very small at the time in Dublin. It was really to get boots on the ground. They didn't want a typical HR person. So a person with solely HR background, because this person in this role would be managing everything from, you know, the employee experience side of things right through to workplace facilities, all the operations of the office. So I think my experience from that regard and the fact that I had divvied into like the employee engagement piece and it was quite a, a an entry level, I suppose, managerial role. Um, but I'd had a lot of experience at like executive level. Um, so I was I was successful in, in getting the job. My manager at the time took it, followed her gut and took a chance on me. And yeah, just as soon as I got in there, I got to grips with, um, you know, more of the HR stuff, partnered with our legal partners, really like upskilled myself on legislation, upskilled myself on, you know, benefits, payroll, all of that sort of stuff. Did a lot of external courses, but that would add value to to my role. And just as we grew, then my, my role grew and naturally then just kind of fell into a position that when we grew and we became more global, um, it didn't really matter, I suppose, where our executive team sat, whether they sat in, in Europe or sat in, in San Francisco, which is where they would have typically sat when we were much smaller. Um, and so the opportunity came up um, when I came back from maternity leave after my second child to take on the, the VP role. Um, so at first, actually, I, I said, look, I'll go to senior director because I want to make sure that it's for me. I don't want to set myself up for failure which I think is really important for, for people to acknowledge in themselves as well. You know, it's not, you don't have to jump the next hurdle, you know, really quickly. It's okay to, to dip your toe in, make sure you're comfortable with it, make sure you know what's expected of you. Did that, felt like, you know, it, it was just an extension of, of what I was doing, maybe working with more senior um, level folk. And then just it naturally evolved from there into the, the VP of people um, globally. So now I have a team in San Francisco, I have a team in Toronto, and I have a team here in Dublin. Um, and they all work kind of more globally with with the functions and, and the teams. Um, and we've built a, a, a great relationship despite being so far apart. That's I, I love the story about the kids, right? And how they end up differently and, and you versus your brother. Because I think about that. I have little kids 
and they're so different, right? And it's oh, yeah. the same household. There's nothing we did differently. They just showed up day one and and some of them want to be by themselves and some of them want to be with friends. So it is funny to see how it plays out. You give it two or three decades and you see where that goes. How, how do you manage all these different continents, right? In a world that is hybrid, are we going into the office, but now you've got extra time zones to worry about. Where, where do you even begin? What's your philosophy on that? Where it's like, even if we all came to the office, so much of our company's not even in this country or in this continent. So, so how much of a factor does that make? What, where do you and the Nitro team fall on this big debate that we're having right now in the industry? So I think for us and what's really been um, what we've really received great feedback on is how we manage that transition to to remote um, work. And I mean, when I was when I was pregnant, I live a good bit from the office. I live an hour from our office in Dublin. I live outside the city. Um, So when I was pregnant, I actually did some of my my work from home and I found myself to be much more productive at home than the office just because you naturally get talking to people. And, you know, that's great because that's where the organic learning happens. But when we moved remotely full time um, and I was actually just after having my second child um, as the pandemic began. So I wasn't here with the organization when they suddenly had to switch overnight to remote work. But when I came back, the feedback that I I found was the fact that Nitro um, takes such a flexible approach to work. Right. And, And our philosophy is that we don't measure it's it's output over hours worked right so um i know there's a huge debate about the four day week and and you know you can stipulate to people you work five days you work four days but realistically somebody could work five hours a day they could be really really productive and they could fire out um everything that they need to work on in that five hours it might take somebody else eight hours and that's fine because it just it allows people to structure their day in the way that they feel works for for them. And I think that's one of the great advantages of of working remote. And I think we've seen it actually in our engagement survey. One of the biggest concerns that came out was people thought that we would actually, there was a bit of ambiguity about whether we would transition ultimately back to an office full time. And I think, you know, when we went remote first, people were very much like, oh, I'm working at home and there's kids and I'm here. and It's just a nightmare. But now people have become comfortable with it. They've realized that there's a significant work-life balance to be had without a commute. Um, but there's also the the benefits of being being in office, right? And that is that organic learning, it's team engagement, particularly for new hires. We had a huge amount of people start um remotely um during the pandemic so we really had to look at our onboarding um, and how do we make that meaningful and how do we make people feel like they're getting the same experience as as they would in an office you're never going to do it 100 percent because if you're interviewing interviewing over a screen is very different from walking into an office getting a sense of the culture seeing you know the the images on the wall um seeing the branding seeing the team work together you don't get that when you're on zoom um So a lot of it was how do we make sure and how do we provide people with the content so they know what it's like to work at Nitro without ever having physically been in an office. Um, And I think that's one of the biggest things. It's, It's how we adapt and how we look at what our candidate experience and employee experience wants to be. Um. And actually trusting people and giving them the autonomy to to roll with their with their work. It's probably easier for you know people who are are more seasoned in their career than than new people they need like if you're entry if you're coming into a job for the first time you need people beside you to say hey i have this person on the phone like what would you do in this situation and that's where we're actually looking i suppose at our you know work at nitro um toolkit which is is what we're we're developing at the moment um especially now that even though covid is still here we're not necessarily in the pandemic anymore so how do we uh, how do we ensure that the teams are getting together, that there is that in-person experience and in-person time? Um, and what does that look like at a functional level? So for some of our finance people, it might not make sense for them to be to be in the office. They could probably do their job 100 percent remotely. But for our sales team, it makes complete sense for, for them to be in the office, to bounce ideas off each other, to, you know, I've had a customer say this. How have you ever experienced that? How do you respond? things like that. So there's different there's different functions that will require different levels of in-person time. And so it's working with the functional leaders to, to understand that. Um, and I think at the end of the day, it, it really comes down to trust um, and to managing people in a way where there's 
very little bias. So we do a lot of unconscious bias training to make sure that, you know, if somebody is, is in the office now that our offices are, are reopened, that there's no bias against those that that aren't in the office. Um, so things like that, things that really resonate with people, but a huge part of it comes back to our approach to flexible um, hours. And so for me, for example, I deal a lot with um, obviously Europe, but I would deal a lot with the management team in the West Coast of, of the US as well. So they come online at, at 5 p.m. my time, maybe 4 p.m., um, which is 8 a.m. Um, PST. So often what I do is I maybe take an hour or two over lunch um, to do what I need to do that I would normally maybe do in the evening. Um, and then maybe around 5.36, I block an hour out in my calendar so that I can spend time with my kids when they come in from the childminder. And then I might log back on from seven to eight once they're gone to bed and then I, I finish at eight. But that works for me. Some people will say they don't want to work till 8 p.m. at night. I don't feel like I'm working till 8 p.m. at night because I've gotten, you know, my day has been structured in a way that works for me. Right. I get that. I, I'm in a similar boat, right, where I'm on the East Coast. A lot of my colleagues are on the West Coast. If I can do a little bit during the day, I don't mind jumping back on the computer at seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock because you know, kids are asleep and everything else is done. So I, I understand that. You mentioned trust, you mentioned management, and I have to ask it, right? Because we're in this environment right now, every big tech company right now, there's layoffs, right? And, oh, yeah. and they don't trust management. And the way that companies go about it, it's, hey, I got locked out of my computer and it just doesn't work anymore. Or we all got called into a meeting and we were fired at the same time. Or I got any, like people are really mad at how it's happened. It's one thing to yeah. say, I understand you have to lay off, but but treat me with more dignity, treat me with more respect. From your point of view, just watching what's happening, and, and maybe you're having these conversations, or not, I don't know, but just from just watching the news stories or hearing your colleagues you know, running HR in other places, what's your perspective on how companies can get this right or how they can really screw this up? Yeah, so it's actually very interesting. Like I've, I've read the the email transcripts that have come out from, um, you know, the likes of Salesforce, Stripe, Coinbase, um, Microsoft. Um, and yes, I completely understand. And, you know, it's extremely hard. But when you're at a company of that size and you're potentially laying off thousands of people, it's impossible to have a one to one conversation. Excuse me. So what we have to do is we have to kind of pair it back and be like, OK, how do we, you know, communicate this in a way that people feel like this isn't the best situation to be in? But I understand and legally we're ticking all the boxes, you know, we're not being unfair um, and that we're, you know, we're treating people with respect and dignity. And there's an example um, of, I think, going around um, and doing the rounds of seeing it, seeing it pop up with the recent Salesforce exits. Um, and, you know, it, it probably is an example and a part of a way of like little things that you can take away on, you know, I suppose what not to do. And I, I don't mean that in necessarily a bad way, but I do know I saw something where, you know, the email went out and um, everyone was told they receive an email in the next hour. Um, but then in the FAQ was like that didn't apply to people in in Europe. So those people were a little bit confused. And then they had, I think, a company all hands and um, the CEO was 15 minutes late. So I think there's little things that obviously some things are unavoidable and, and things happen. But there's a way that when you're doing something of such magnitude that affects people so personally and has a huge impact, I always say, like, whenever I have to let someone go um, for whatever reason, it's never about me. Like, it's never about me. It's never about the business. It's never about the company. And I, I still this throughout my team. It's about the other person. So what are they feeling like sitting there right now? And how are you making sure that they feel that you're respecting them, that this is a absolutely awful situation to be in. Nobody wants to deliver this news, but that at the end of the day, when you walk out of that meeting, you still have your job. This other person doesn't. So we actually went through our own reduction in force uh, during the, the middle of last year. So around July time. Now, we're quite lucky that we're still at that, you know, kind of just below the 500 mark of, of um, employees. We let go, I think, of... 30 people overall um we had a one-to-one -one. we scheduled it we spent a significant amount leading up to that globally so it wasn't just in one region it was globally we had to make sure that there was a HR representative in each meeting with the manager and some managers had maybe two or three people that they had to let go 
But how did we make sure that everyone had the same experience? So everyone had a face to face or, you know, virtual conversation with their manager. They could ask questions. And then afterwards, they immediately got their paperwork and there was no ambiguity. And the feedback we got on that was that it was so well handled because everyone understood, even the people who were leaving the org, unfortunately, they understood that it's not, you know, something that we want to do. Um, but unfortunately, it's happening. And back then in July, it wasn't really happening at a mass scale. It is now. Um, but that the way we handled it and the way we approached it and the the manner in which we dealt with people and afforded people an opportunity to ask questions, afforded people, you know, the face to face time, it was really, really appreciated. So I think depending on like what size company you are, you know, how many people you're letting go. I think there's a way to navigate it and to look at other companies. And unfortunately, in some cases, you have the Twitter debacle, you know, what worked, what didn't work. Um, but then also regionally, there's different like, I mean, the whole thing with Twitter blew up because in Ireland, it was like, you're not legally allowed to do that. And I thought to myself, I'm pretty sure they have the legal boxes ticked. But what's coming out in the media is the high level. But I'm pretty sure underneath they're ticking the, the legal check boxes. So it really is just about communication and transparency. I, think. I, I was just going to ask you that because you're in Ireland and, and they mentioned that in that story and, and you always hear. So if you don't know much about how it works, you would think oh, geez, I should never have employees in some of these countries because their government rules make it seem like it's impossible to stay flexible. And, and I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to ask you, what's your thought on that? Or that some countries, are they making it anti-competitive in a way? Because it's like, geez, if you hire somebody, you know, it's like you're married to them forever. You can't get rid of them. And, there's, and, if, there, and if there's a downturn, how do you deal with it? And, and the Twitter one was a perfect example of that, at least from a media PR point of view. Yeah. And I think it just it depends on how you the planning that goes into it and the understanding of the law. So uh, not to, to delve too much into Ireland, for example, but um, for the most part, you can make someone redundant. There's a clause where you can't backfill their role for 12 months after you make them redundant, um, which typically doesn't happen anyway in, in terms of a redundancy because um, you're making the role redundant. But when you have more than 10% of your workforce being laid off for whatever. And it's important to look at it at entity level. So, you know, many companies are one name, so it's like Twitter, but I'm sure Twitter has hundreds of entities. So that an entity level, you're looking at how many people are you letting go within that entity? If it's more than 10%, then in Ireland, for example, you have to enter a consultation process, which is a 30 day process. Now, you can lock people out of their account for 30 days. You just let them know that their role is at risk and they may be made redundant. There's a way to do that um, that doesn't involve just, you know, I suppose it, it's all about formulating different comms for different groups of people. So sending a comms, and I've often found this you know, even kind of as we were growing, comms that went out um, that were very US based and very tailored to, you know, kind of US um, legislation or, or maybe US wording and, and, and context, that doesn't resonate with people then in it who are used to a different a different way of dealing with it. So I think it's about looking at it at a regional basis, not looking at it as in like I'm looking at Twitter and I'm saying I have however many thousand employees globally, I'm going to let 10 percent of them go, which is maybe, you know, a couple of thousand. Um, and this is the comms I'm going to send to everyone that that won't work because you have to tailor it and you have to look at your it's all about your audience. So you need to check your audience before you actually go and make that decision. And, and how do you tailor those comms for the audience? Just to let you know, Ireland actually isn't I know it was all over the news. We're actually not as um, employee, I suppose, friendly, as we say as some of the other countries that I've, I've come across now as we've expanded. So mainland Europe, the likes of Belgium, France, Germany, way more, um, way more complex in terms of employee legislation than than Ireland, which I think is why a lot of companies set up set up in Ireland. It's kind of somewhere between, you know, the employment at will in the US versus, you know, the really complex um, contractual legislation that you have to follow in mainland Europe. I'll, I'll move off after this question and go to other <laughs> topics, more fun topics. But, but when you say it, like you look at Belgium or some of the neighboring countries there, does it discourage companies from hiring people, or especially now when everyone's hybrid or remote, everyone, you can hire anyone globally. Does it make managers think like, hmm, do we really need somebody there? 
I think so. Like, I, I can't see why it why it wouldn't. The great thing about moving remote is that suddenly you opened up the talent pool to not just hiring in a location. So if you had offices in four or five different locations, you generally hired into those offices. Your talent pool was limited. You were competing in a market where everyone was the same. Everyone was hiring in Dublin. The fact that you've gone remote means that you have access to much more talent. Now, in terms of actually employing people, there's a little bit more complexity to it um but i think if you have the option of employing someone and there's actually what's happened is there's a load of these um what are called employer of record so companies that have set up where you can employ somebody say in latvia or lithuania where you may not have an entity to employ someone but you can employ someone via these companies so they your that your candidate is technically employed by the company, but they act, walk, talk, do everything as if they're working for for you. It's just literally in the background. The paperwork is there to facilitate the employment. So even things like that are involving are allowing managers to think, well, where am I going to get the best access to talent? So look, looking outside of where we would typically look, you know, where has great engineers, where has great, you know, kind of marketing people, where have great um you know, accounting people. And how do we access that talent? Um, like the best talent at the best cost um, and best for the for the team as, as we're expanding, bringing in obviously all the cultural nuances and, you know, experiences that are going to make the team more diverse, grow, more open, more transparent. So, yeah, I think I think there's a, a certain level that, you know, will, as we continue to evolve remotely, will have people thinking, you know, how do we higher for the best and best for the company, but also the best for the candidates. Those are the things that scare me, right? Because I live outside yeah. of New York City, right? I've always been a New York City person in the the high tax, high cost of living, high income places. And now I'm competing against the entire world, yeah. right? So I hear what you say, like, that's great for companies. That's bad for people like me. And I think about what you said, how you upskilled yourself. So yeah. I think about how do I upskill? How, how does anybody upskill? So what, what are you doing at Nitro to help employees there progress in their careers. So let's say they can stay and you get the benefit of them staying while they're growing. Because we know a lot of times people leave because like, hey, there's no path for me forward here. I'm not developing. So it's important that you that you do that. What are some of the things that you've been working on in a concrete way to you know have benefit employees, but which fundamentally benefits the company? Yeah. So that's something that has actually really come up in the in the last year. And I think it's, you know, because of maybe the macroeconomic environment how that's evolved, you know, people are afraid to maybe leave a job because it's secure at the moment. And, you know, they don't want to start somewhere new where they they become, you know, they're starting a probation period and things like that, but they don't want to become stagnant either. So we have in the last year or two really up leveled our, our L&D program. It's something that I'm currently working on this quarter as well with the team. Um, and so we've gotten access to every employee, um, which the company cover for LinkedIn learning. So there's thousands of, of uh, streams of content on there, whether it's courses, whether it's learning paths, whether it's, you know, one off webinars um, that they can use to, you know, and, and they can certify at the end of it. So if they complete a learning path, they, they get a badge on LinkedIn to say that they were certified. Um, in addition to that, we have a couple of partnerships with like universities and institutes um, that provide webinar series, master classes that people can attend. Um, we have a partnership with the UCD professional academy and actually this is a really good example of how being remote um, and being in this virtual world has really helped so normally what that would have involved would have been only available for people in Ireland because it's obviously and it's a university in Ireland um, it's a professional academy that allows people to complete diplomas across a number of different um, a number of different functional areas and and um, areas of employment so you have HR you've business you have finance you've technology you know sales they and then you you walk away with your diploma you would have typically had to be an Irish employee to avail of that because it would have been on site you know a Wednesday evening every week um, for 12 weeks if you signed up to a course the great thing now is that we have people in all over the world doing it because what might be a Wednesday evening from six to nine for somebody in Ireland is actually a Wednesday morning from you know, 10 to one for somebody on the West Coast, it's middle of the day for somebody on the East Coast. And again, that comes back to the flexibility, right? So you're allowing people like you're you've signed up for this course, it's on um, 
company hours, that's fine because it's going to benefit you and it's going to like help you grow in your role and in your career. So we have things like that that we can offer that really, I suppose, virtual and, and remote working has, has opened up. Um, in addition, we are in the process of developing really structured uh, career development paths for, for each of our roles. Um, it's not a small undertaking, given that there's a huge amount of, of varying roles, even within, you know, functions. So you don't just have an engineer. There's like system engineers, there's quality engineers, there's software engineers, and, and all have different levels of, of skill sets. Um, so it's about working with leaders and managers to understand, OK, if you are a junior engineer, how do you like what does a senior engineer look like and how do you get to that? And we're building out a, a framework that has, you know, here's what a senior engineer, lo engineer looks like in terms of core competencies, behavior, experience um cross collaboration so somebody can see completely here's where my gaps are i don't have x y and z so i don't have x y and z so i'm going to talk to my manager about how i develop x y and z and then we have a platform that allows you to develop a growth path so you can develop a growth path that lasts three months six months with your manager with regular check-ins you agree on tasks or you know things that are going to help you address your gaps um, that you have in terms of progressing to the next level. You agree that with your manager, you agree a timeline, you agree, you know, how, what does measure, what does success look like? How do we measure success? And you work down through it. So then at the next performance review cycle or promotion cycle, you have set yourself up in the best possible position. Um, and that doesn't mean, you know, there's an automatic path to to promotion. But what it does mean is that you've gone above and beyond to make yourself, um, you know, the best candidate for maybe a promotion cycle that we might do. But it also means that if that role or if the next role that you're looking for isn't necessarily av available in Nitro, you move on to maybe somewhere else where you can, you know, you get a role that that is in that area. But the value that Nitro has added is that it's helped you grow in that way. And I think, you know, people move on. Like we all we all have to accept that. There's a great book um, called Legacy by James Kerr. And it's about the um, All Blacks, the rugby team. He and he follows them. And one of the one of their, I suppose, core values is they always said, leave the jersey in a better place. Right. So it was I like, like yeah. So that resonates with me because I'm like, even if you want to move on, if you have to move on, you know, if it's outside of your control, inside of your control, it's a decision you made or not. If you can look back and say, I gave 100 percent, I gave 100 percent to the company, I gave 100 percent to me. I have left the jersey for that role in a better place. You know, I've left the company in a better place. I'm in a better place. Then I think it's a you, it's a recipe for success. So it's something that always um it always resonates with me because I, I talk about it to employees when they they kind of think about like, well, what if I do all this and then there's no role for me? Like that's that's OK, because it's part and parcel of growing your career. Is there an ideal amount of time that you would like someone to say? I, so some companies have a philosophy of we want people here for their whole career and other companies have a philosophy of we want to see some churn. Like we want everyone to be gone in five years because we want to bring in new blood. You know, you see these different approaches. Do you find there's a, a sweet spot of, of how long people are sticking around to balance wisdom that's carried over versus new blood bringing fresh ideas? Yeah. So I think you need, it's, it's a fine balance and, and you do need a balance of, of both. Um, and I think what I've noticed at Nitro is when I started, it was a very young organization. So I was in my early thirties when I started at Nitro, I was probably one of the, the oldest on the, the office floor, as they say, um, we had a sales team that were quite young. We had a engineering team that were, you know, had, had young people starting off in their, in their engineering careers. Um, so what we've done is we've evolved over time where now actually the majority of the workforce are in that probably 30, I would say, to 50 age bracket. It's evolved from, you know, having drinks in the office, you know, drinks every evening, you know, socializing with, with work friends, which, you know, kind of happened a lot, just how the culture evolved. But it's evolved into, you know, people who have families, who have responsibilities at home, who have young kids, who need job security, who need job stability. Um, so, you know, 
that people and, and people who are seasoned in their career, if they're making a career move, they're making it because they're looking for the next opportunity. Now, it might not always be the right move, but for the most part, they're educated that they're moving on. I do say like it's it's different for people. I see people moving on solely because they've been offered, you know, maybe more money. Um, and what I, I often say to people is look at it at a, at a whole. OK, so what what would you sacrifice? So you might be offered something over here that's 20 or 30 K more. But what does that look like from a work life balance perspective? Are you going to have to work in an office five days a week, you know, and not have your own right. work? Is that so, money really worth it? A lot of times. Yeah. It is not at the end. Of yeah. The year. So it's trying to educate kind of young people. But there is a there is a balance. Like we started a, a kind of an intern program and we actually have a number of interns every year who come in. And we've had some interns work, you know, with us from an internship, go back to college, finish and then come back to us full time. Um, and they develop the institutional knowledge. Always when you have somebody who's here a long time with institutional knowledge, it's hard to see them go because they're taking with them stuff that really can't be taught because it's just naturally been learned over time. Um, so you kind of tend to look at like, OK, what are we doing to retain people who are in this stage of their career and maybe this stage of their personal life? Um, and how are we attracting that that young blood in and, you know, upskilling them so that either they stay or they learn a bit, they get a bit of experience and, and they move on, but they've added value. And I think that's all we can ask for is that when you have, as you say, young blood come in, that you feel like they feel like that they've left the jersey in the better place. And you feel like when they've left that you've given everything you can give to them um, and that you're happy to leave that door open and you're happy to remain in contact with them. And I think that's a really positive thing to, to walk away with. Okay, I really appreciate the conversation. It's given me a lot to think about. I like the leaving the jersey in a better place. I like your approach. You've got a difficult job. I'm glad it's for you and not and not for me. I, I think I'm closer to your brother, right? Like I'll just be a scientist and and you know just just do that by myself. So I really appreciate the time today, Katie. So such a fascinating story. Thanks. For, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It was great chatting. Thank you to my guest and thanks for listening. Subscribe to get the latest episodes each week and we'll see you next time.